Today, I would like to get into the topic of how we fulfill our filial duty to our parents. In the previous sessions, we learned how to be a decent human being because that is the starting point for our Buddhist cultivation. Shakyamuni Buddha gave Dharma talks for 49 years. Where do we start among these fast teachings? Buddha told us to start with filial piety. There's no beating around the bush about this. This is the foundation. When he said that, it's actually very wise because it brings out all the afflictions, all the troubles, bad habits we have to the surface. Every one of us has bad habits, and these bad habits have created a lot of obstacles in our life. If you want to list them out one by one, they are too numerous. So using filial piety, he has summarized everything that is wrong with our current state as ordinary beings because if you want to overcome your own habits, everything, every single habit that happens in your life, if you want to uproot them, resolve them, you have to start with filial piety. This is by far the best part of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. So we will go in depth about filial piety and why Buddha started from there told us to start from there, if you want to go more deeply into Buddhism. So why do we begin with filial piety? How do we do that? How do we do our best being filial? If you look at modern times, this concept of being loving and respectful towards your parents and elders is quite strange, foreign. Some people don't even know because some people, a lot of people, have this idea. As long as I have money, I earn a lot of money, I can support my parents with a lot of good food and good shelter. Let them live a luxurious, lavish life. I think that's filial piety. But is it actually filial piety if we just do that? You can't say it's not, it is treating them well. You're treating your own parents well. But to be actually filial, you cannot measure it. It's not quantifiable. You can't use money, how much money you give your parents to measure how filial you are because what about those who are poor? Does it mean that only the rich people can be filial and the poor people cannot? No. So we need to have wisdom in regard to these teachings. So how do we do that? How do we actually fulfill our filial responsibility towards our parents? What kind of attitude should we have? This is a very important question for youth, young people, because this idea is quite distant so we need to remind ourselves. Some people might say, cook good food for parents, buy good clothes or gifts for them, and that's what we call perfecting filial piety. But it's not there yet, because anyone can do that. There's no need to practice or cultivate at all. If so, anyone can, if they earn enough money to, just buy whatever, gifts, whatever clothes, whatever food for their parents, and consider that filial piety. If they want a TV, buy them a TV. Is that called fulfilling your filial responsibility? No. A lot of people do in this era. If you talk to them, I want to share with you the importance of being filial toward your elders or being loving and respectful to elders. A lot of people say, are you out of your mind? 
or are you outdated? Are you one of those people who are like statues made from 1,000 years ago and that would never change according to the era? Isn't Buddhism about following the era, adapting to the era? Why do we stick to such outdated concepts? What era are we in now? This is a view that's shared by a lot of people nowadays. Some even say Buddhism itself is outdated, cannot follow, adapt to the time, to the era. Some even told me, Master, do you know what era this is? It's the era of looking forward to wealth. Without money, without wealth, even though wealth cannot do everything, but without wealth, it's a lot of pain. Some people, when they hear this, it might make sense. Without money, how can you eat? Without money, how can you pay for your living expenses, or buying clothes, or building a Dharma center? Without funds, how do you make offerings, right? It makes sense, but we need to see it from a point of wisdom. We need to look at it wisely instead of being dragged by it, being enslaved by the idea because it will push us towards extremes in hedonism and all that. Everything is about money. It has become extreme now. So back to filial piety, if you look at the West, in regards to this idea of Xiao, education is very common, very developed. It's everywhere. Everyone got educated, but unfortunately, these kinds of human values, moral values about love and respect towards parents, about how you live with other people peacefully, harmoniously, are neglected. Moral values are neglected. They don't have a concept of filial piety. Most of them only retain the value of taking care of only your children. So only take care of your children. Children are the only ones who need to be taken care of. Not just the West anymore. It's already commonplace throughout the world. The adults are only focusing on the youngest, neglecting their elders. So as a child, as a son or daughter of the parents, they focus their gaze towards the next generation and very few will look back at their older generations. So being an old man or old woman in this era is very lonely. The family tie is very loose. In the Dharma place I host, there's a lot of elderly people. I ask them, why do you like to come here? Usually they come by themselves. A lot of these elderly practitioners, brothers and sisters, told me, there is no one with me at home. I feel lonely. When I come to the temple, I have people to talk with. The temple is good because I have a social environment. At home, everyone is busy with their own family and with their work. I can't find a chance to talk with them often. So this is a reality facing a lot of families nowadays. And thinking about ourselves, we'll be old one day. One type of suffering is loneliness. Loneliness itself is suffering. Why do I teach this from this perspective? I would like to give you an example so that you have a concept of why filial piety is important. Then I will explain how you do it, how you fulfill filial piety towards your elders. For example, a new couple focuses on setting funds away for their youngest rather than their elders. Say a married couple who have children or when they start having their own family, plan very well on giving their children funds, saving funds for their children's education and living expenses. 
They take great care to make sure their children are well taken care of. Some even do that before they have children because they need to think about funding for their children's education, universities, projects, and all that. Like my sister, I asked her, why do you work so hard making a living and earning your money? My sister would reply without thinking, without money, how can I support my children? So that's the framework. The emphasis is heavily on children, and that's the part where parents are great because they all think about their own children at their own expense. It's correct to have this planning, but how many couples think about their own parents, say, planning a retirement fund or giving them funds so that they are settled? Some are from a wealthy family and their parents are very rich. They don't even need to think about helping save for emergencies in order to help their parents, so they don't think like that. There are good people that are not like this, but very few. As you can see from the news, most of the cases are like this. My parents are wealthy now. I will wait out my parents so that I can split the inheritance when they pass away. So they are looking at the money rather than their own parents. So their eyes are focused, their whole mental energy is focused on how to get the money rather than taking care of their parents. Some are even worse. They think about how my siblings got more than I have. That's not fair. So you plan for your own children, but your children are looking after your inheritance rather than taking care of you. So we need to know about this. It sounds like we're sharing the inheritance from our parents, but most of the time, the reality is they are fighting in court or outside the court over the inheritance. Being a parent, sometimes it's a hard thing because without money, you can't support them. And with too much money, you have this problem. Everyone is fighting for inheritance. So having a child who is not filial is a lot of pain waiting for you. I myself have witnessed this a few years ago. His father had passed away not long ago. His children already argued for the money, the inheritance of their parents, of their father. With this kind of attitude, how can you let your parents pass in peace? How can their parents pass in peace? Some don't even wait until their parents pass away. They already do that while their parents are still alive. Some are even worse. As worse as they fought so much over the inheritance, they neglected the funds needed to help their parents in the hospital. When their parents got ill due to old age, they even neglected that part. So if we look at all these cases that actually happen in society, read the news in each society, not just one part, you see that happening everywhere. So I have a friend, when he was rich, everyone liked to be his friend. When his company went bankrupt, everyone disappeared people nowadays. That sort of human love among each other, the brotherhood, sisterhood, is lost. Everything is about money. Everything is about taking advantage of others. When they eat, they think about money. When they sleep, they think about money. When they wake up, they think about money. Everything is about money, enslaved by money losing their humanity in the process and becoming a goblin, basically. Sometimes among different religions, some, their parents are Buddhists and the children are believing in a different faith. So they, the children, are even threatening their own parents to believe, to follow their faith. 
threatened them, saying, when you pass away, I will not take care of your passing. Take care of everything that happens during your passing, including the grave and all that. The basic human respect isn't there. It should be there. Human decency. That's what we call it. Is it because of the era? Is it very human to be like that? Where did we go wrong with human society? So let's take a daily scenario rather than just inheritance. When they look at good food, good clothes, good gifts, daily provisions, how many people are thinking about their parents first before they think about their children? Mostly they are like, oh, my son likes this, my daughter likes this. How many people think about their parents? Hey, I think my mom likes this, or my dad likes this. There are very few. Back then, I used to bring a lot of young people to visit another country, and I observed them. Like other young couples, they usually think about their babies, their newborns, or their own young children. Very few of them think about their own parents. But you can see the way it goes. When their children grow up, the same thing happens. This is the consequence of only thinking downwards without thinking about what comes before you. Downwards means children, upwards means parents. So I like to continue to say, is it wrong to think about your own children? Being a parent, is it wrong for me to think about my children, plan for my children's well-being? No, it's not. There's nothing wrong with that. But respectful practitioners, you must know that there's a saying in Chinese that goes like this. A tree has its roots, water has its sources. Remember your roots where your roots are. Who gave you a condition to have a life? Who gave you a condition so that you can live happily, be able to stand in society, and be able to make a living? The things you wear, the things you eat, the things you achieved, who gave it to you? Who helped you to kickstart that? Your own parents, our own parents. So that's why when I look at some families who have their own parents nagging them, I feel very happy for them. It's also a joy in the world to be nagged by your own parents. I think this way because in my case, my mom passed away when I was studying and my father passed away not long ago. So I became an orphan in a way. I am an orphan now. Appreciate the presence of your family, especially when you're hungry, there's someone cooking for you, when you're sick, there's someone taking care of you, finding the best medicine for you. When I'm sick, who takes care of me? No one, it's true. Sometimes I think I live by myself. When I pass away, no one will know. That's why I cannot be sick. Every day, the Dharma protectors, they call me and say, Master, please make sure your phone is on all the time, 24-7, because if anything happens to you, when we try to reach you, we will know if something's wrong. If you turn off your phone, you will not be able to communicate with us. It's a blessing to have your parents with you, still with you. This is why in Chinese ancient wisdom, the sages kept saying that you have to think about your roots, to remind ourselves to be a decent human, to be a proper human. Once you become a decent human, only then are you able to achieve happiness. If you can't even be a good human, decent human, let's not talk about going to the Pure Land, the three upper realms the three good realms. The human and heaven realms are not achievable at all. 
So being a decent human is the basic goal because our parents gave birth to us, nurtured us, and educated us. And because of them, we can grow up as healthy adults, able to make a living in society, achieve great things in society. There's a saying as well in Chinese about our parents' kindness towards us. It's boundless, as boundless as the sky, as the universe. Buddha said in the Sutra of profound kindness of parents and difficulties in repaying them, as it describes the parents' kindness as like the heavens and the sky, there's no end to it. No matter how much you do, no matter what you do, it's very hard to repay them in full. In my case, I can't even repay them anymore when I have the ability. This is to remind ourselves of the importance of filial piety. Also, we need to learn to remember their kindness because if we don't remember their kindness towards us, how can we repay them? Also, in return, we do our duty to take care of them and make them happy. So that's where the saying of remember your roots came from. However, we need to see it in modern times. Those who can be filial towards their parents, it's not like no one is good, no one is filial, no one loves their own parents or elders. There are people who love and respect their parents, but it's already considered a rare case. This human demographic is rare. Therefore, in Buddhism, when you practice, it will point out among the four great bodhisattvas, you all have to start from Kasidigarbha Bodhisattva. The Sutra of the Original Vows of Kasidigarbha Bodhisattva talks about filial piety, about roots and foundation of a human, of a Buddhist, is filial piety. And repaying kindness, because if you do that, you are a good example to the world. Everyone will feel the importance of being good, remembering the goodness, kindness, and repaying the kindness of their dear parents. If a person can't even remember and repay the kindness of others, how can this person stand their ground in society? How can this person survive in the society and be able to develop in this society? How can you have a harmonious and prosperous life? This is why the Sutra, the original vows of Kasidigarbha Bodhisattva, becomes a foundation of 49 years of Shakyamuni Buddha's Dharma. It's the groundwork for Buddhism to grow and humanity to grow. It's a necessity for human beings to learn it. That's why, although education is very good and highly developed in the Western nations, this concept of repaying kindness, filial piety, is non-existent or uncommon. Not just in the West right now, it's global, universal. If this world keeps going on like that, forgetting their roots, forgetting being kind, then being a human in this kind of world is a torture. It's a lot of suffering. It will get more and more torturous, more and more sufferable. We are not trying to be pessimistic or depressing, but this is the trend we're going towards. For example, a lot of people who are raised or educated in the West or grow up in their society are very curious about the ritual of ancestor remembrance or what we call ancestor worship. They feel it's very weird how some followed their parents, Asian parents back in the East, do this worshiping to their ancestors. They feel it's very weird because ancestors passed away centuries, millennia ago, like thousands of years ago. 
Why do we remember these people who we never met? Why do we remember them at all? It is because of that kind of view they treat it as superstitious. In Chinese, there is a very important day. It's called Qingming. It's a day where we visit the graves of our ancestors, our passed away family members. Many people join the family to sweep the graves. This is a common thing we do. We sweep the graves. They feel that it is weird and do not understand why we still visit those who have passed away. All of these traditions now stop at the elderly people because they still have the idea that I still need to remember my grandparents, my ancestors. But nowadays, young people, you see, have stopped this practice. Some even in the temple. One of the lay Buddhists said to me, Master, when I pass away, please spread my ashes after my cremation into the sea. I told him, you cannot say that because we never know who will go first. The world is impermanent, so you cannot say that. So we don't know why a lot of people treat this kind of ancestor worship as superstitious, impractical. It's normal. Why? No one's saying anything about why. That's why no one's talking about why you do that. Why should we have to remember our ancestor, worship our ancestors? Like the act of worshiping ancestors, what does that mean? No one talks about that. They just follow. That's it. In Indonesia, myself, I promote ancestor remembrance so that they are remembering, know how to feel gratitude, experience the gratitude, the feeling of gratitude towards their parents and ancestors. That's the point. However, when COVID happened, it cut short our activities. I hope that in the future, Sydney could do that as well, celebrate ancestor remembrance. If it's not promoted, that means no one is explaining why we do that and what's the core value behind this ancestor worshiping, the act of ancestor worshiping. Then humanity is, that's it, it's gone. Humanity is gone. That's why I felt like I was encouraging the Sydney temple to celebrate the spirit of remembrance towards our ancestors, so that they cultivate a sense of gratefulness, experience the gratefulness towards their own parents and their own ancestors. But in all honesty, people are not aware of it. That's why. Buddha told us that the Chinese word filial piety was very well made. This is one of the examples of why Chinese characters could be regarded as the best, complete, is the best among many words made in the world. Why is it best? It is because it has been passed down for 5,000 years without stopping. It is because Chinese characters are made of symbols. Every symbol has meanings, a lot of meanings. You can go everywhere carrying wisdom inside. We must understand these Chinese characters were made according to the six principles, according to the six writings. Filial piety is based on one of the six writings. One of them is called ideographs. What are ideographs? Ideographs, when you look at this word, immediately you experience the meaning it carries. So the word is supposed to show you the meaning straight away. Like patience, in Chinese, the word is a combination of symbols. On top is a knife, at the bottom is a heart. That means even if the sword is on top of your heart, you must persevere, and this is the feeling of patience. You need to let go of these agitations, things that agitate you. So in this society, 
it's even more important to be patient. So back to the word filial piety. We already mentioned the combination of two other Chinese characters into this one, filial piety. It combines elder and the young. When two become one, then it's filial piety. A lot of people, they say, generation gap, or I don't understand my parents. Okay, boomer, and all that. Why does that happen? We could understand it as an absence of filial piety, absence of heart-to-heart, -heart, absence of oneness between the elders and the youngest, because we must understand one reality. The younger generations will have their own younger generations. The elders have their own elder generations. They are one thing. The elder was once the younger. The younger will become the elder. So they are one. In Buddhism, what do we learn about filial piety? In Mahayana Buddhism, filial piety the whole of the universe is one with ourselves, like a body, not a family, a body, and this is very profound, straight to the core of it. It is because when you expand filial piety, love and respect, when you expand it, you can go all the way to the end of the universe, which is endless. Other than Buddhism, Buddhist sutras, there's no teachings of philosophies that can expand this to this level. They can't talk about filial piety to this level, to this scale. So without Buddhism, we couldn't fully grasp the profoundness of filial piety beyond just your parents, because it's about one with everyone else, everything. How can the left hand work against the right hand? What I mean is that they don't oppose each other. So understanding this, if you humiliate others, you are humiliating yourself. If you're hurting or harming others, it equals harming yourself. If you understand why we need to be compassionate and filial, we will understand why Buddha told us to be filial. Knowing this relationship, we will understand why Buddha tells us to start from filial piety. In Buddhism, there is a sutra, the Brahma Net Sutra. It's about precepts or conduct of a bodhisattva. You have to expand your love and respect toward your parents, i.e. filial piety toward your parents beyond them, to all beings, and this is the standard set by Shakyamuni in this Brahma Net Sutra, towards all the bodhisattvas. To qualify as a bodhisattva, you need to have this kind of heart, this kind of filial heart towards not just your parents, but towards everyone. Everyone's my parents. Everyone's my father. Everyone's my mother. This is because every single being, not just sentient beings only, but all beings, our future Buddhas and our parents in the past lives. This is the foundation of Buddhist filial piety, oneness with the whole universe. Love all because everyone is one with you. This is a very deep, very, very profound understanding. So in daily life, how do we start with this? How do we achieve this perfection of filial piety? So the Buddha has already given us the foundation, the basis, the theoretical foundation of filial piety. If you can start from your parents, love and respect your parents, and expand this love and respect toward all beings, then you are a bodhisattva. This is why Amitabha Buddha is great, because he treats everyone like he treats his own dear parents. His way to show his love to all beings is Pure Land, 
as a human on our level, how do we do that? My mom has passed away. Some people might say, I'm very old, I'm 80 already. How do I even be filial at this age, right? What should I do? There are three ways in total how we perform filial piety in our daily life. First, towards the people, towards any encounter, towards the material, our environment, we must be grateful. Like how we feel from our parents, their love from them, we use that kind of love towards all beings. It is because in this life, it's very hard for us to fully repay our parents' love. But the least we can do in our repayment of this kindness is to expand this love towards everything you interact with. The people, the encounters, the events, and the actual material world. In Buddhism, we categorize this into four targets of repayment of kindness. First is parents, then is the triple gem, which are teachers. Starting from parents, by loving and respecting them, only then can we expand to our teachers. When you love your parents, you will learn how to respect the teachers. Then towards the country that gives you a safe environment, and then towards all beings, because think about our position in this world. Are we alone? Can you survive by only being with yourself, by being alone? No. This is why the triple gem is precious. Dharma teachings are precious because they teach you about this. They tell you to open up your mind toward all beings. Be grateful towards them. Then we move on to the country. Without country stability, how can we prosper? How can we survive and continue to live happily? And finally, all beings who give all the services, all the material resources. Without them, how can we have an environment like happiness right now? When someone scolds you, you also need to be grateful. When people criticize you, we need to practice gratefulness towards them. When we are defamed, slandered, or humiliated, we all need to learn how to even be grateful towards these people. It is because no matter what happens to us in the future, no matter what happens, no matter who does what towards you, or no matter who you are in the future, doctors, teachers, leaders of your own field, or public servants, or being parents, no matter what you are doing, we must always remember that we cannot lose our moral compass and virtues. That means we cannot lose our ground. We cannot live without this bottom line, because if you always cross the bottom line, which is against your conscience, the consequences are not only impacting your own family, you're impacting your own next generations and also your own past generations. Say, if you always do things against your conscience, doing something that's harmful towards others, how will society look at you? How will society look at your family and your own descendants? This is such a big transgression. The point is, no matter how wealthy you will be in the future, or how powerful you will be in the future, that's not the main point. It's just the fruit. The root is you must not lose your compass. You must not lose your virtues as a human. How can we be a virtuous person? Start from Buddhism. Start from listening to the Dharma. Listen often to them. Some examples are like Teacher Chai talks about starting with DZ Kuai. Venerable Ching Kung's talks on cause and effect and the Sutra of Ten Virtuous Deeds. All of these are very good teachings. The last one 
on our path to being a bodhisattva, we need to guide our parents to liberate them from the sufferings of life and death, which is to help them to give rise to the vow to be reborn in the Pure Land. Only when they are born in the Pure Land will they no longer have to suffer life and death. When your parents go to the Pure Land is when your filial piety is completed. Same for us. When we chant Amitabha, even though I'm 90 years old, but if I chant Amitabha earnestly, when I manage to be born in the Pure Land when my time's up, I will not fall into the three lower realms. This is the best thing we can do for our parents, because not only are you helping yourself when you go to the Pure Land, you're also able to know where your parents are and help them to increase their current standards. In Taiwan, there was a lady, a lay Buddhist, who accompanied her mother when chanting Amitofo, accompanied her mom to pray to Amitabha Buddha, describing how good the Pure Land is and how there's no death, no aging, and no illness. How good that place is. That's the only place where we can be together forever. That is how she encouraged her mom to chant Amitofo, to be strong and to vow to be reborn there. That's how we fulfill our filial piety towards our parents. If we go to the Pure Land, if you go to the Pure Land, you are considered as fully repaying your parents. If you're able to reach the Pure Land, that means you are able to repay your parents in full. So how do we start this journey? We start from being grateful, being ready to repay their kindness at any time, then move on to increasing our virtues, our moral conduct, and then in the end, we go to the Pure Land. So in summary, what's the best way to practice filial piety? chanting Amitofo earnestly. This is the simple explanation on how we fulfill our duty of filial piety. If I want to go in detail, go in depth, you cannot finish the concept of filial piety in one day. What we need to know is how we practice it. We start with our attitude, with our conduct. Parents do not need you to worship them every day, like you worship Buddha. They don't need you to do that. They just want your attitude, a loving attitude, good attitude, harmonious attitude. That can establish a very beautiful, peaceful relationship between parents and children, because if we have a very bad temper, very rebellious temper, that kind of attitude towards them, it causes them to worry. So to be filial, to be loving and respectful towards them, we need to use the best condition, best attitude we have towards them. Offer them our best attitude, our most virtuous conduct. Filial piety can be considered as hard, but at the same time, easy to be achieved. Because towards other people, we are virtuous. We can easily be patient and kind. But towards our family, our parents, we can't be as gentle and as loving as we are towards others. If we can't do that towards our parents, be kind to our parents, then whatever kindness we have towards others is false. It's not real. If our parents have a very bad temper or bad habits, we need to be patient. We need to use a very good attitude to melt their shell. So one day they will be touched by your change, by your kindness, by your gentleness. So this is how we as children, as a son or daughter, treat our parents. Only ask this question, is my attitude good towards my parents? First, are my words kind toward my parents? This is something we need to know and keep asking ourselves every day.
So that's it for today. Next Wednesday, I would like to continue understanding Buddhism, other parts of it, because we still need about six or seven more courses to complete these teachings. If there's any misunderstanding from the way I express these teachings, please give me feedback, because the point is, we know a lot of teachings. We know a lot of what is right, but when we implement it, we need to practice how to implement it. How we practice being grateful, being aware of others' kindness, and repaying the kindness towards them. That's the basics of being a decent human being. So I wish you all a healthy life, chant Amitabha earnestly, and that everything accords to your wishes. Thank you. Amitabha. Let us dedicate our merits. May the merits and virtues accrued from this work repay the karmic creditors of many lives, repaying the sentient beings of all time. May all the calamities turn from big to small, small to nothing. Repay the four kindnesses above, relieve the suffering of those in the three paths below. May those who see or hear of this aspire to invoke the Bodhi heart and cultivate the teachings for the rest of this life, then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. Namo Amitabha. Oh, Okay, bye. 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 Bye.